of the Lord. Our first reading on this fourth Sunday of Lent is taken from the first book of Samuel. Let us reflect on faith as a form of seeing, as a form of light, in order to see Jesus as the true light of the world. Light to see the true light. In the first reading, Samuel was sent to the family of Jesse in Bethlehem. And God had already told Samuel that there, among the sons of Jesse, God has chosen the next king of Israel. So Samuel had that in mind. I will be anointing a king. And I'm sure if we are in the place of Samuel, our minds would start reflecting what are the characteristics of a king who could be chosen by God as king. So most probably Samuel entered the house of Jesse with his mind already made up. These are the criteria that we or I should look for in a potential ruler of Israel. And so Jesse started a parade of his sons before Samuel. Seeing Eliab, Samuel thought, certainly, surely, this is God's anointed. But God told him, no, not him. And then he asked for the other sons. So uh, Jesse brought his seven other sons. And every time Samuel would say, oh, maybe this is the one. Oh, maybe this is he. God will say, no. Then came the lesson. Human beings look at appearances. That's what you see. That is the light that you consider. Appearances. But God looks into the heart of the person. God looks for another light. The light that comes from the interiority of the person. The saving factor here is that Samuel was attentive to God. Imagine if Samuel was not open to God's communication, then he would have insisted on his own criteria. He would have insisted on his own norms. And so he would have anointed someone that was of his choosing and not someone chosen by God. This is something crucial, my dear brothers and sisters. If we do not see the way God sees, then our actions may be our decisions and choices and not necessarily God's choices and decisions. The openness of Samuel is something that we should emulate. So he asked Jesse, do you have anyone left? And Jesse, as though as an afterthought, remember the youngest, David, who was standing the sheep. He was very young. That's why Jesse probably did not think of him. Look, even the father was operating from his own set of criteria. If Samuel was looking for a future ruler, then not the youngest, who knew nothing but tend tending sheep. But when David was presented, oh, the message of God was clear. He is the one. Anoint him. And the Spirit filled him. This is a different type of sight. The sight that comes when the light that envelops us is the light of faith. And with the light of faith, we see the light that comes from God's will and not 
just the light that comes from human wisdom. We hope that this fourth Sunday of Lent may open our eyes to the true light that comes from God, the very person of Jesus. Word of the Lord. Our second reading for this Sunday is taken from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. We have been reflecting on faith as a form of seeing, as a form of acquiring light so that we can see the light of God in Jesus Christ. That was the experience of Samuel who used for a while his own way of seeing and judging in choosing among the sons of Jesse who would be the ruler anointed by God. But God, thanks to God, who communicated with Samuel. Now, Samuel was reminded that God's way of seeing is quite different from our way of seeing. And so God indicated to him that it was David, the one that his father Jesse did not think of, and someone that even Samuel would not consider as ruler. But God sees something. Now, in the second reading, St. Paul tells the Ephesians, Be correct in your judgment of what pleases the Lord. This is an invitation to acquire sight and light that will bring us in harmony with the Lord. What pleases the Lord? Now, some of us will say, oh, I know what pleases the Lord. And I've been avoiding the things that displease the Lord. Just like the rich young man who asked Jesus how he could attain to eternal life. And Jesus said, well, follow the commandments. Many of us will probably say, yeah, I know what pleases the Lord. I know what displeases the Lord because I know the commandments. And that is right. That is a way of seeing. That's a way of being in the light. Because we see also what is in the heart of God. But St. Paul pushes, pushes this to another level. Seeing the light, we should live by the light. It is not enough to see. Having seen the light, let that light be the rule of my life. That's why he tells the Ephesians, you used to be in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. How do we become light in the Lord? Through our deeds of goodness and justice and truth. So here, we are moving from spiritual insight or spiritual sight to living. If I may paraphrase the words of St. Paul, let us complete our being in the light. Very often, there is already present in our minds and hearts what we call spiritual insight. We know what pleases the Lord. We know where the light of the Lord is located. In truth, in justice, in love, in integrity and peace. We know that. We have seen that. But living as the light of the Lord is another matter. And I'm sure we have all experienced that. From insight to action, oh, there is no guarantee that there will be some sort of consistency. Sometimes when we see the light, we become afraid also of the implications and the consequences uh, to us and on our lives if we follow the light. And St. Paul is very, very uh, realistic. He does not encourage us only to remain on the level of seeing what pleases the Lord. He pushes us to do 
what we have seen. And by achieving that, we do not only propagate the light of Christ, we become light in the Lord. What a beautiful description of a follower of Christ. You are light in the Lord. Jesus said that already. You are salt of the earth and the light of the world. May our faith lead to living action so that it's not just the heart that sees the light, but other people will see the light of Christ in our acts of goodness, truth, and justice. Gospel of the Lord our Gospel passage for this fourth Sunday of Lent is taken from the Gospel of St. John, the healing of the man born blind. We have been reflecting on faith as sight, as a gift of light from God, so that we may see the true light, who is Jesus Christ. In the first reading, the example of Samuel is quite instructive for us. He had his own understanding of the criteria of someone who could be ruler of Israel. And so he somehow had his choice among the sons of Jesse. But God sees differently. And the saving factor here is that Samuel was open to God's communication. And so when David was presented, this unexpected figure, the youngest of the sons of Jesse, who probably knew nothing but playing and, and being with the sheep, God's word came to Samuel. He is the one. God sees something in David. And Samuel somehow agreed with what God had seen. In the second reading, St. Paul tells the Ephesians that we should, again, judge, see what pleases God. Again, spiritual insight, seeing the light in the eyes of God. But St. Paul pushes it. It is not enough to see. You have to live according to the light that you have seen. So, Christians, disciples, should be light in the Lord through their deeds, their actions of goodness, truth, justice, and love. So, seeing the light should lead to living the light that we have seen. In the Gospel, we see a slow process of seeing granted to the man born blind. Let me focus on two points. First, seeing the true Jesus. Seeing the true Jesus. This is a unique type of healing event. The blind man did not even ask Jesus for healing. In fact, the matter was brought to the attention of Jesus in the form of a question. Whether this man became blind because of his own sin or the sin of his parents. You know, during that time, sickness was associated with sinfulness. But if this person was born blind, then it could not have been due to his sinfulness. I mean, he has not done anything sinful. So, his condition might be associated with the sins of his parents. But Jesus reversed it. He said, no, neither he nor his parents had sinned. This is an occasion to show the glory of God. And so even without the request, a request coming from the man born blind, Jesus acted on his blindness and did something with the saliva, with mud, and the miracle happened. 
the man was restored to sight. And people started asking him, Who is he that did this to you? And his answer, I do not know him. He has not seen yet who Jesus is. His sight has been restored. But has he seen the truth about Jesus? Not yet. Came the Pharisees who started questioning him. Are you really blind, etc., all of these things? But when they learned that Jesus had done the miraculous cure on the Sabbath, aha, they had their sight. They said, no, no holy person could have done this miraculous cure. For God will not answer the prayer of a sinner and someone who does work on the Sabbath is a sinner. But the blind man says, I do not know what you're talking about. But you see light coming slowly to the blind man. He says, how can God answer the prayer of someone who is a sinner? He must be good. He must be holy. If he prayed for me, for my sight, and God heard it, then I don't know. You claim he is a sinner, but I cannot believe that. He must be a holy person. Slowly, slowly, the person begins to see, not just with his physical eyes, but with the eyes of faith. Then he came in contact with Jesus. And Jesus asked him, Do you know who the Son of Man is? And he said, No. He says, I am here before you. And the man said, I believe. I believe. That's the fullness of sight. Not just the sight coming from the eyes, but the sight of the heart. He now sees the truth about Jesus, not a stranger that has done something for him, not the sinner as claimed by the Pharisees, but the Son of Man, the light of the world. He now sees the truth about Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, we need God's grace to see the truth about Jesus. Do we really know him? If Jesus asks him the way he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? By what light will we give an answer? Let us pray to the Lord for spiritual insight, for the light that can come only from him as his gift, as his healing touch, so that we may see him as the true light sent by God. The second and final point that I want to reflect on is what hindered the Pharisees from seeing who Jesus was? Two things. First, they were so caught up in their interpretation of the law that anyone who, to their interpretation, transgresses the law could not be on the side of God. But in so doing, they have already put God in a box, a box that is the box of their interpretation, narrow interpretation of the law. And so when God comes, surprisingly, in a different form, beyond or outside their concepts and their expectations, they could not believe that God is present. My dear brothers and sisters, this is one thing that we should avoid. It will lead to spiritual blindness, to darkness, thinking that we already know God. And that God is a fabrication of our ideas and concepts and not allowing God to reveal who He truly is. Which leads to the pride. And this is the second point. The pride, the spiritual pride of the Pharisees. 
they say, oh, we see clearly. But it was Jesus who told them, ah, because you claim you see clearly, you are the ones sinning. You're telling a lie. All of us have blind spots. All of us have moments of blindness. And we need to beg the Lord to give us the light. Only humility will enable us to acquire the light that comes from above. And only humility will enable us to see Jesus for who He truly is. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, know, have seen, have heard, have listened to the songs of Fatima Soriano, a girl, a missionary of the Word of God, through her testimonies and her songs, no? a girl born blind. No. Uh, she is my uh, kababayan from Cavite. No, I was the one who confirmed her after her uh, uh, kidney transplant. Listening to one of her many testimonies, you know, I was really struck by the fact that maybe I'm the one blind. <laughs> and she's the one who truly sees. When she was asked once whether she felt she has felt sorry for herself, whether she felt envious or, uh, uh, of others who could see, her answer was direct, plain, and full of light. She said, well, I was born blind, so I cannot compare my condition with the condition of those who have sight. I have grown up in this condition, and I have experienced so much love from people and so much love from God that I can say I have not been deprived of anything. I can see because I have been made to see what love is. Oh, I cannot say that. <laughs> and I feel sorry for myself that I would have to go through a long journey to be able to say I have seen. But who teaches me how to see? A girl born blind. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it.